Hi all, before we get uh, started with the session, there's a few instructions which I would like to say. Uh, the first uh, thing is that today's masterclass has been taken by Dr. Siddharth Hashmi and the topic uh, for today's masterclass is investment analysis and portfolio management, where she would be um, uh, guiding you on how to make a choice among the, uh, the investment analysis among a group of investments and how do you make a choice among it. And um, this is a recorded session. So, and I have all the muted all the participants from my end so that we have this motor recording process. So once uh, she finishes her session, um, the floor would be open for the learners to ask your doubts. So you can raise your hands um, as um, uh, the unmuting from your uh, end uh, is disabled. So you can please um, raise your hand and uh, we can reach over to you, each of you. Uh, in the event of any doubts. So please note that keep your doubts all towards the end. Uh, so once she finishes the session, um, the you know you can start asking your doubts. Thank you uh, once again, everyone, for uh, joining this session. And I would like to welcome Dr. Siddharth Hashmi also to it. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Siddharth Hashmi. Yes, so very, very good evening to all of you. I believe we are good to start. And uh, I would request if you can acknowledge uh, the audio and video. Reno is clear for everybody. All right. So today our uh, topic for the session is going to be or going to revolve around the fact that we need to understand what a portfolio is, what are the investment theories, and definitely the principles that uh, surround uh, around the term of investment. Also, just to tell all of you that today, this concept of portfolio, which was introduced by Harry Markowitz, and I'm sure you might have heard about this person because there's a very famous Markowitz theory as well, which uh, is a modern portfolio theory named after him. He had got Nobel Prize for coining this entire concept of portfolio in way back in the year 1959. And today you can see an entire industry, be it anywhere in, in any part of the world, is flourishing on this concept of portfolio. And that is our mutual fund asset management company or industry, as well as we are now having wealth management industry, wherein we're seeing banks and financial institutions like Standard Chartered, City Bank, which are moving into wealth management for their esteemed clients and they're looking at customized portfolios for these clients that they have so that is why from the industry perspective so globally as well we can see that the mutual fund industry where we're talking about not just mutual funds for the retail investors but even customized portfolios for high net worth individuals for clients which are corporate clients, companies, and companies like Amazon, companies like Alphabet, that is Google. And you know that BlackRock is uh, the world's largest asset manager. So probably today we will understand all of these things in our session. What are the principles of investment, investment theory? What the concept of portfolio is? What factors do we keep in mind while we need to design our portfolio? And after we design our portfolio, how do we evaluate or how do we keep evaluating the risk and return which is coming in from the portfolio? And if need be, we would also rebalance or revise our portfolio, make changes in our investments depending upon the trend that we are in. Okay, so I think before we start off for these are few important uh, lessons that are very important for all of us being intelligent investors, which are our goal. So firstly, it's uh, this is the book which I think you all should read. That is by Benjamin Graham and uh, The Intelligent Investor. And it talks about principles which I've just extracted. That is, firstly, we need to buy investments, particularly stocks, which are cheap and also safe with companies which could grow and could do, could do well in the future. Also, we should not overpay for growth and only for the fact that they fit into the market trend. Stocks help us to provide returns against the inflation. So this is a very, very important uh, aspect now when we are talking about investing. And you can make a note of this in your laptop or in the book that you are referring. You 
should understand that today, why is a need to construct the portfolio? Why are we having this discussion today? Is because and why like the asset management or mutual fund uh, business in the world is thriving, okay? So reason behind all of this is earlier people could stick to conventional pension plans or maybe some bank savings, bank uh, scheme, saving schemes. But today we cannot do that because the inflation in our economies is almost at a 40 year high. It's at a multi-decade high in the entire world. And if we're talking about inflation being at a 40 year high, for us going ahead, the value of money is only going to increase or decrease. Can I have a response in the chat box now? When there is increasing inflation, can you tell me just write increase or decrease in the chat box? The value of money will increase or the value of money will decrease. What's your answer? Yes, everybody. I just got two responses. Yes, very good. So with the increasing inflation, the value of our money is going to go down. Okay, so this is going to be extremely important for us because if we have to plan for our retirement, if we have to uh, maybe buy a house or we want to start our own business, we have such financial goals. We need to include stocks in our portfolio. We need to look at equity because that's the only way where we'll get a return which will help to beat the inflation. Okay, so even if the inflation peaks at maybe 7 or 8% as it was doing in the past few months post the pandemic, the, the stocks will provide you a return which will help you to take home a good amount of money and which will also increase or appreciate the capital that you have invested. Okay, also whenever we are investing the portfolio that we are designing, one of the important principles is that we need to look at a longer time horizon. Because in the market, there are various cycles. There would be ups, there would be downs, there would be inflation, there would be several factors. Like I think 2022, 23 post the pandemic has been the year or have been years of geopolitical tensions. And these geopolitical tensions have largely impacted economies. They've impacted the equity markets. So we need to be patient. We have to look for opportunities where we can buy the dip where we can invest at uh, lower levels and where we can wait and allow our money to grow and then redeem our capital at a higher price. So that is why a longer investment time horizon is always required. Volatility should not be uh, something which we should be scared about. We should not be scared about the fluctuations which happen, whether it's the green, whether it's the red signals, People are always happy on the greener signals. Of course, that's how the case should be. But we should always look at the red as that is an opportunity for us to invest and get into the markets. The more the volatility, the more opportunity you have to make money. The lesser the volatility, lesser opportunity you have to make money because everything will be so sticky. I mean, it's not going to be increasing, decreasing. It will just go like the sideways. And you will not have the opportunity to make profits or large amount of profits. Be conservative in bond investing. So bonds are opposite to equities. Bonds, as we know, are fixed income instruments. These would maintain stability in terms of the principal or the amount that you have invested. But bonds will give you a regular interest. And at times, they might also give you an increasing interest particularly at a time where we are in an inflationary scenario, you would see that bonds would provide you higher interest rates, okay? So what you can do is depending on the mix between how much you want to put in risky assets like equity shares and how much of non-risky portfolio or non-risk portfolio you want to maintain, you can balance out. Everyone can make different choices depending on their age, depending on the financial goals they have. But we need to be slightly conservative uh, and not invest huge amount in bonds because we want to grow our money and we want to beat the inflation. Okay. Do not over invest in equities also. So kind of maintain a balance. Balance is the key. Also maintain a discipline in investing. It cannot be like, you know, today we have a class and we started learning about portfolios. So we will tell everybody around us to invest and we'll start investing. 
it has to be disciplined with a plan how much money you're going how much money you're going to put in what is the money that you want after three years after five years so it has to be pretty disciplined okay also we need to be careful about mutual fund companies and not blindly invest our money in mutual funds the key to investing in mutual funds so what is a mutual fund basically a mutual fund is nothing but it they're companies they're asset management companies who take money from investors like you and me and they put them into different equity shares of companies could be bonds also and maybe international funds okay nowadays a lot of mutual funds are even investing in precious metals like gold and silver okay so we have to be very careful and we have to deep dive and see their portfolio their portfolio as to where our money is going to be invested and if we feel this is going to give us a good return in future then we select those mutual funds also mutual funds so ethical or unethical they have been okay so do see the background about the mutual fund companies as well yeah so if any queries with these points i would request you could uh, just put it in the chat box now firstly understanding the meaning of the term investment okay so the term investment refers to two aspects one is that we save money okay and second is that we postpone our consumption if you want to buy something now i think savings is very straightforward and clear but if we want to postpone our consumption what do we do or what is postponed consumption so basically if i want to buy a iphone 14 which has come into the market right now but at the same time i feel that the market trend is where i can invest my money now the markets could be at a lower level there could be a december effect which comes in so anybody is aware about the De december effect have you heard about it? Yeah. What is the December effect? So generally in the world, we follow the calendar year. And if you see that this is the last month of the calendar year, right? And when we talk about December effect, we know for that matter of fact, investments in this year. Okay. And the most important thing about the December effect is that you would see the markets would decline a little bit. All right, so you do not zoom now and then you make the consumption at the late stage. So, postponed consumption is that I'm not buying the iPhone 14 right now and I would buy it in, in the future. Okay, and the most important aspect about uh, this is that we would be putting this money into the markets, we would be putting this money into the equity, we would be putting this money into the bonds. So this is how the consumption would be postponed, okay? So this is the total equation which talks about investment where we have savings, what we are saving today, as well as what we are postponing as the consumption for tomorrow, okay? So you can write down this equation when we talk about investment. Now, this is a very simple flowchart which is very clear, but I think we need to deep dive into two things. One is the investment goals. And what is the advantage of investing early, okay? The earlier we invest, it's very critical in terms of the growth that we get, okay? So if I invest early and if I see the next five years are going to be years in which there's going to be growth, okay? So what we do is that we put money now so that at a 20%, 10%, 12%, my money keeps growing, if I invest after five years or if I invest after a year also, what I'm losing is a 20 or a 12 or a 15% return. So it's very important to start investing early to capitalize, okay, on uh, the money that we have and pour them into the markets, okay? Next, the most important thing about investing early is, like say you and I, okay, we feel that we're very young now to think about uh, retirement, but important aspect is that when you and I would retire, we would need a lot of money, okay, for our retirement, considering the inflation that we have. So thereby, we need to start investing at an early stage, okay, and help in compounding of our money, help in growing of our money, so that we are able to accumulate a good amount on the investment, okay? Then, setting investment goals. 
So when we talk about goals, now here we are talking about our financial goals that we have. What are the reasons why we need to invest money? So there is one goal that we've been uh, discussing or talking about is retirement commonly. But there could be other goals also, other financial goals. Could you write one goal each in the chat box or what you think your financial goal would be? Yes, Malcolm, I can share the presentation. No problem. Come on. What could be a financial goal? Okay, financial freedom. That means um, Handy is trying to say that we have sufficient money for um, our future and we don't have to worry about paying our bills. So that's very important, Handy, because we need to have an emergency fund also, which needs to be created. I'll tell you about that. Very good, Malcolm. Securing for the education of your children. So for that purpose, you need to, that's your financial goal and you need to invest for that. Come on, what else? It can be anything like even a traveling or holidaying, having a vacation across the world. That could also be a financial goal. Very good. Family, a future healthcare, retirement. Yeah. Again, secure future becomes like a, a broad thing. Okay, Lucy, making money, enough money to live without worrying for bills. Again, retirement, financially stable. So I'll tell you guys that investment goals are very specific. For example, I want to buy a house. Okay, so I'm planning to buy a house in the next five years. What is going to be the value of that house in the next five years? Okay, it's going to be, say, $5,000, for example. I'm just taking a very random example here. So I'm saying that it's $5,000. So how much money I need to start collecting now that in five years, I'm able to get an amount close to $5,000 as much as I can accumulate. Oh, that's a good one, Peter, to pay off student loan. To say my student loan is about, say, $20,000 or $25,000, I need to pay that off. So how much I need to pay it off in maybe the next three years? So how much money can I accumulate to pay off that loan? And as far as possible, I would try to accumulate an amount close to $25,000 to pay off the loan, okay? It could also be collecting money for some future education, upskilling yourself. So the goals are very specific. And to each goal, what you need to outline is what is the value or what is the cost of it, okay? Next most important thing comes is the time horizon. How much time do I have to uh, achieve this goal, okay? How much time do I have to achieve this goal? Three years, five years, because according to the time and according to the value you want, you will be able to decide which investment you would be choosing, all right? Then you keep investing regularly once you have done this and then you be patient. Do not panic with the ups and downs in the market and you'll be able to achieve your goal. In case you're feeling that because of some external factor, because of inflation or maybe some policies of the government, you are not able to achieve that goal. What you could do is you could definitely rebalance or shift some of the investments in your portfolio so that you can achieve your goal. Okay, any questions out here? This is a simple investment process that we need to follow. These are the different uh, goals that we can map out. Okay, you can probably note some of your own goals down. So whenever you start planning for your investments, please write down your top three goals. Also, I would say do not um, like, you know, kind of put in too many goals because it might become very difficult to invest. So put limited goals which are realistic and achievable. It could even be planning for taxes. Sometimes investments could be done so that you can plan out your taxes. So I'll tell you one aspect or reason behind this December effect. December effect, as I said, is where people all across the world might want to sell off their investments because it's a holiday, Christmas time. It's a year end. It's a financial year end as well. And what people do is they do tax law harvesting or they have do harvesting of their taxes. Now, what is this tax harvesting? So I have made profits from some shares in the year, okay? And I might have made some losses on some deals or maybe I'm seeing right now that some of my investments are in losses, okay? Obviously, no one wants to make a loss, but you know, this can also be an advantage. So what we do is, we sell off the investments which are in losses in the financial year end in December and I will set off 
I will minus those losses against the profit and I will save my taxes. The taxes that I need to pay on the profits of shares. So this is also tax planning which can be done with the help of investments. Okay, So you can write this as an example because that you will not find in the PPT. This is how, this is a survey which was conducted and this is how people would invest in mutual funds or people would invest in different investments and design a portfolio because these are the goals that they would have. Either it could be retirement, it could be reducing, managing the taxable income, emergency or savings, getting some current income passively because all of you said that, you know, we want to live uh, uh, freely without worrying about paying bills. So that means that you want some supplementary income to also come up. Planning for education and even buying another house. This is an example of compounding. Okay, so it's very simple that if we just put like say about 5,000 rupees or say $5,000 and if there is compounding happening at the rate of 15%, then this is the kind of figure that you can expect your money to grow. That means 60,000 in a year compounded at 15% when the markets are good and strong, you can get in five years, 4.37 lakhs, 10 years, 13 lakhs and 15 years, almost 31 lakhs, and then 66 and almost 1.38 crores in 25 years. So look at the figures of compounding, and that is why systematic investment plan, the SIP, has become so popular as a mode of investment where every month you keep putting a certain amount, like here the amount is just 5,000. You keep putting 5,000, you can look at 15%, how this 5,000 is going to grow and compound. So these are the goals which you see on the left-hand side and these could be, uh, you know, how you can plan out to achieve these goals. So this is the need of having a portfolio, okay? So every investment could be mapped to your financial goal. Now, how do we take decisions? What are the factors which impact our decision-making? So first and the most important in today's time is the market dynamics. What are the factors in the market around us which are going to influence our investments? Because see, our investments are uh, not like they are just, you know, in the bank. They are going to be out in the market. It's going to be influenced by policies of the U.S. Federal Reserve, of the central banks of your country. It's going to be influenced by the decisions the companies are taking. Like I wanted to show you all or probably what I can do is I'll share a link with you all when it comes to, um, you know, we work a company which filed for bankruptcy. Okay, so it could be anything. There could be so many factors which could impact businesses and which could impact the markets. Elections, I think 2024 is going to be the year of elections across the world. In several countries, there are going to be elections. So this is also a very important factor which influence the market dynamics. Another factor that we're seeing is influence the dynamics of the market is, of course, inflation. The recession figure, fear, okay? Like, whether there's going to be a recession, there's not going to be a recession. So, there are so many things which keep on influencing, um, you know, the market. I should tell me that if there is a recession, uh, okay, my question is, is, can the recession make you rich? Okay, I'll ask you a straightforward question. Can a recession make you rich? Can a recession be an opportunity uh, to be rich? Yeah, so everyone's kind of saying yes, because when the recession, there will be a crash in the market, you buy in the crash, okay? You take advantage, you buy the crash, and then later when the markets rebound, okay, you would be able to make a lot of money, all right? Of course, Evans, that is right, that, uh, you know, uh, it would depend on what your portfolio would include. But definitely in the recessionary phase, where there's a crash in the market, you buy the dip and then you take advantage of the uh, market when it's on the high. Yeah, this session is recorded, so do not worry. And I think recording will be shared by Edubex. It can be emailed to all of you. So I don't think you need to worry about that. Okay. All right, great. So yeah, so as I said, like the market dynamics are uh, something which is very important in terms of even how recession, elections, 
the budgets which are presented by economies across the world, all of this impacts the market, okay? Today, geopolitical tensions are impacting the market. The relations between uh, countries is impacting the market. So we need to study time in and time out what are the market factors, okay? Now, I have something to show you on the recession. Let me just share it with you. We are joined now on set by a special guest here to share his macro outlook and talk about debt and M&A expectations and so many other things. Guggenheim Partners Executive Chair uh, Alan Schwartz is here. It's great to have you uh, back at the table. Nice to be back. Uh, a lot to talk about. And I always think of you as somebody who has your pulse on the corner office, if you will, sort of the CEO set and what's going on in the boardroom these days. And so we're watching the markets play out. We've also got a whole bunch of earnings uh, reports that have been coming over the last couple of days. But I'm curious sort of how you think that translates or not into confidence, if you will? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I think uh, in boardrooms and in the C-suite, um, I think that the that corporations, the, the larger corporates, public corporates, kept their balance sheets very strong, uh, unlike lots of other parts of the market. And so now that they're seeing some of the, they were kind of out of the M&A market in a lot of cases right. because of private capital. And so now they're seeing a chance to come back in right, because they kept their balance sheet strong. At the same time, the macro environment, um, especially geopolitical and all these other things, um, you know, creates concerns in the boardroom as to whether now's the time or wait on some of these things. So what we're seeing is we saw a big drop in M&A activity, right, when uh, the capital markets tied up for a mm -hmm. lot of the private deals. But now you're seeing a lot of, uh, let's say, discussions and activity beginning, uh, clearly picking up from the corporate side that's seeing their opportunity to come in. Uh, but, you know, how many of those will get across the line? Right. We're going to have to wait. But does see. that signal then that there's a confidence that we're not heading into a 2024 recession or soft land? What, is, no. what does that mean? No, I, I find it's very interesting. You know, they're not sure about the economy. And personally, you know, I was in the camp that 23, we would not see a recession because of the strength of consumer balance sheets to start out and demographics, which people don't pay enough attention to. And so we didn't expect higher rates to hit consumption right away for a whole bunch of those reasons. On the other hand, in talking to Ann Walsh, our CIO, we keep an eye on what's happening in the um, in the banking and the financial markets. And, and what's happened is the duration risk that lenders and a number of borrowers took takes longer to be impacted by rising rates. Uh, but it's happening. There's a tightening in conditions. So we personally, we believe there's a recession coming. Now, we don't know how deep. It's hard to know. Going back to your question, though, just to set right. that up for that, going back to that question, I think that a lot of companies are looking now strategically for the long term Right. And they're really not just looking to consolidate, although certain areas are. They're really looking to get the capabilities and the technologies that they need for the very changing environment they're looking at. And so a lot of the deal activity will not be dependent on the economy unless there's some big, you know, disruptive wave. How much of the hesitation is just, look, if you're a corporate, you've got to answer for the price you pay. So you don't want to pay too much and look like a dummy. And if you're somebody being acquired, you don't want to accept a bid that's too low. So just trying to get to that feeling of, I think yeah, this I is mean, a great you, you deal, but your, I'm going to have to justify it. No, you it. put your finger right on it. I would say it always happens. Sellers are saying, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, look at my 52-week high. You know, buyers are going, yeah, but that doesn't count anymore, right? But and look, a number of sectors are pretty far down, too, right? So um i think that you know corporations that feel like they have a strong strategic plan and, and let's say this that have strong backing from their investors on the plan they're on um they're looking to step in now because they've been telling people they've been waiting now they're starting to see the sellers come and say let's be a little more reasonable yeah. and then look the one other issue that we all know is antitrust that's having that's having a bit of a chilling effect but the fact that companies that decided to fight Right. Um, this latest antitrust wave and have won is giving a little more confidence that if if the facts really support that so, they should be able to do it, that they'll go forward. But does that mean the conversation in the boardroom is saying, so we're in, what are we, end of October, called mid-October. Do they say, let's wait a year and see what the world looks like in, in terms of a political world a year from now or, or let's strike now and see what happens? 
I think there's more strike now. Uh, as I say, if you've been if you've been sitting there saying, "Look, we really need these capabilities for our right. long term. We really need this technology." Or this, so again, not, right. a lot of it's not consolidation, because in the consolidation wave, you'll see a lot of right. uh, stock for stock. But on that side, I think since they've been waiting, you know, they don't know. They don't want to miss the window. How concerned should we be if you consider them the smart money? that private equity has effectively stepped away from the table, if you will, when it comes to deal making. We were looking at, they were represented something like 40% of the marketplace in terms of M&A right. just about a year ago, right. and now what is it, 25%, or something right. like that. So if you, if you think they know something, uh, it may be a great opportunity for strategics to get in insofar as they don't have competition, but uh, there might be a reason for that which may not be very good. Well, no, I, I don't think that's what's driving. I think uh, a lot of the, the larger private equity firms have new funds and they're really looking, but they're kind of waiting on the financial side of the equation. On, on, you know, interest rates are way more important to their deals. Right. And that's where duration risk, okay? In the private equity wave we saw, which was a lot of different deals, a lot of them were financed by floating rate debt, right? And so there's a lot of those deals from the past where you're starting to see delinquencies, you're starting to right. see bankruptcies, and that's part of why, say, Ann Walsh and I think we're still, we, we think there's already a tightening of financial right. conditions, and so that group of buyers is more affected by the tightening of financial conditions than the corporates who have been sitting on cash who can come in. Okay, so just to uh, summarize this video for all of you. So what is being told here is that uh, firstly, there are corporations or companies who have good amount of money with them and uh, they would be able to uh, sail through. Also, there are mergers and acquisitions which have been happening in the past post the pandemic. Plus, they are talking about the private equity investors who declined from a 40% to a 25% because probably in the equity market, there are more investors who would be willing to invest. So they would not stick to just the private equity investors. Definitely, there could be a recession around the corner in 2024. However, this year, they've been able to uh, sail off is by managing the inflation and I think keeping the spending uptick. Okay, like now also recently, if I have to give you an example of uh, this propaganda of the Black Friday sale, okay, this is only to increase the spending increase the spending in in the market so more people spend more people use credit cards more people use credit and what happens is you keep the engine you keep fueling the economic engine and the economy keeps going ahead the markets keep moving ahead because you're spending money you're putting money in companies and corporations and they have more sales they have more um you know products to offer they innovate better they embed better technologies into their uh, organizations so that's what market dynamics is all about. Okay, so these are the few things from that uh, CNBC video. But in your daily time and your daily life, you should also follow the markets. How do you follow the markets? Because when we're talking about portfolios, it's very important to know about the markets and be abreast with it. So how do you follow the markets? Do you all read some news, watch some YouTube channels? Uh, do you all have some apps on your phone? How do you follow the markets? Newspapers, anything? Anything on the Instagram? Okay. Yahoo Finance, very nice, James. Okay, news apps, social media, correct. See, so there's something which I can just probably tell all of y'all that uh, if you guys are on the gram, on the Instagram, you can probably follow certain pages like the WSJ, that's the Wall Street Journal. You could follow pages of CNBC. You could follow Bloomberg. Okay, so these are few things which will keep you updated with what's happening in, in the markets. Yeah, yeah. Keep reading the newspapers and follow something on uh, the Instagram or probably even uh, international news channels you could follow. That will keep you updated so you know how you need to go about managing your money. Okay. Yeah, so African market definitely would be less manual comparatively. You can refer to Google News. Um, I think you can select your region and that would work. Okay. And Brian says mainstream media. Now, coming on to the next factor is the financial status of the investor. How much money you have and how much risk you are willing to take. Okay. These two kind of go hand in hand also because somebody who would have a little larger sum of money or a larger corpus in hand 
they would be willing to take a little more amount of risk. Okay, so how much money you have and uh, also, okay, the kind of risk preference. Some people would not want to take any kind of risk and some people would want to take risk because they know that's the only pathway to earn return. Also, as a funda, I would like to say to all of you that um, always go with the risk or understand what the risk is. Do not run only behind the return, okay? Because if you do, uh, if you're only chasing returns, like say you're chasing a 20% return and you do not look at the risk factor, whether you are willing to face it or not. Like say, for example, a lot of investors in the past few years have been avid investors in cryptocurrencies. Why? Because they see like, oh, it's 30% return, it's a 40% return. But look at the cost at that 40% return is coming in. It's, it's a very, very risky investment in fact it's not meant to be an investment but because of the volatility people are largely investing into it so the most important aspect is that we should look at the risk automatically we will get the return but if we keep running behind the return without assessing the risk it's going to really be a big problem okay i mentioned about the time horizon and the knowledge of the investor that's why i was asking you like what are the channels you're following also, I think we've got a response in the chat box wherein um, AfricanMarkets.com, David has recommended a few platforms, CNBC Africa and AfricanMarkets.com. So I think those who are um, kind of not following anything in particular, you can definitely follow this. Yeah, CNBC covers different regions differently. So I think CNBC Africa would be good for all of you. Okay. This is the classification of the investments because before we deep dive into how the portfolio is designed what are the investments we select we understand what the investments are so equity okay equity is marketable marketable it will be impacted by the market factors by the market dynamics who comes to power in us uh, what kind of regulations we are introducing in our country what kind of levels of uh, corporate growth we have manufacturing growth we have the integration, like, you know, now for Africa, for India, for Brazil, Russia, and China, there's a very important integration that's coming up. That's the BRICS. And how this is going to pave the way for growth of these developing and emerging economies, I think the right term would be emerging economies, would largely influence the equity growth in our markets. Okay? So equity is very marketable. All the mutual funds which invest in equity in stocks, that would also come in the same bucket, easy to buy and sell impacted by the volatility and on the other side you have bonds you have treasury bills like t notes which are non-marketable they are fixed income instruments so the plus point about them is they are not impacted by market dynamics and they will give you a fixed return whatever has been told like it's a six percent seven percent five percent you're going to get that return come what way so that's a fixed return that you're going to get okay completely non-marketable so you might have to wait for the maturity period, you might have to wait for the redemption, okay? And it's not going to be easy to liquidate them if there's an emergency requirement of money. Okay, so it's very difficult to buy and sell. We'll have to maintain it uh, in your name. So these are very simple classifications of investments. Okay, now just to pick up, this is a very, very broad list uh, of different investments. But just to pick up a few when it comes to designing a portfolio, it could be equity shares, which would also give dividend as an added advantage. Certain bonds and debentures, which could be listed, okay, in uh, the market. Yeah, that is what you are rightly mentioned, Malcolm, and that's why I've mentioned your listed bonds and debentures. Certain bonds can be now traded and sold off in the secondary market. That's quite possible. And they also provide interest to us. There could be preference shares, okay? Bullion. So this is very talked about now because gold, silver have been two precious metals which have given us a 20% return in last one year. But again, I understand the factor behind it. The factor behind it is the geopolitical issues because whenever there are geopolitical tensions, different countries, central banks of different countries would start parking money in precious metals. And they would take advantage because they know 
that the value of the gold and the particularly value of gold would go up in such scenario. Okay. Then we have exchange traded funds. So these are mutual funds, but they take advantage of the price differences in the market and it helps the investors to also sell them out. Now we have new investments coming up on the real estate. That is the real estate investment trust being very popular across the globe. And then we also have cryptocurrencies and derivatives, but two very risky investments. In the non-marketable, it would be insurance, which would which we need to take for our families, uh, healthcare and protection. If you have dependents, you might even take a life insurance. Okay, you have post office or bank savings, deposits that you can keep with companies and certain provident funds and also schemes which can be introduced by the government from time to time. Okay, some pension schemes also. So all of these are like different investments which could be a part of your portfolio. Okay, again, you're not choosing any investment, you're an over investing into them. Like you're not going to over invest in gold, you're not going to over invest in equity, you're going to balance out depending upon what your risk tolerance is and what your market perception is. Any questions? I think we're soon uh, coming to the question uh, QA part as well. Okay, yeah, it's just I will now share with you another uh, presentation. After we've looked at the investments and we know that portfolio means dividing our money into these different investments. That's the meaning of the term portfolio. We have to divide our money into these different investments so that we are able to get the maximum return Okay, at uh, the possible risk that we can uh, face. Now, this is a calendar which is showing you in the past 10 years, what's the kind of return different investments like domestic equity has got fixed income, gold and foreign equity has given. Now, this uh, entire calendar and breakup tells us that we cannot over invest in any one investment or security. We need to mix and choose our money from different, different investments. Because even gold, like people might feel like, oh, gold is like a very good investment and it will always appreciate. But can you see there are years where there are negative returns in gold also? Okay, there are negative returns in gold as well. And yes, there are years in where you've got a 23% return in gold. Okay, you've got a 27% return from uh, equity in India. Okay, internationally, foreign equity has given you like a 26% return in 2019 prior to the pandemic. But once the uh, pandemic was in force, the interest rates were going down. You can see fixed income investments have given very less returns, 4.4. Okay, so this is how because of the market factors, different investments would behave differently. It's very important to diversify and choose investments from different areas and then design a portfolio. Yeah, before we go on to the measures, I would also like to show you a slide for yeah, some rules of investment. Okay. So these are some thumb rules of investment. Yes, we did discuss about starting early, saving more, keeping a designated amount, Paying off the debt first, otherwise your debt will eat up eat up all your investments. So first you pay off your loans, whatever are there, and then you start moving towards investing. Going in for retirement from day one, not putting all your eggs, all investments in one area and compounding so that money keeps growing slowly, exponentially. Okay. So this is the basic understanding about what a portfolio, what are the investments which are there which we can, we can choose for. Any investment would get impacted by the risk. Risk is a probability that there could be a loss. Okay, so here we would see there are different types of risk which could be related to uh, the company, the corporation. It could be related to the economy. Certain risk factors we can diversify, we can minimize. Okay, We cannot control some of them particularly the ones which work in the market. The ones which we can diversify, we can diversify by creating a portfolio. And as I said, we can put our money into different investments, be it bonds, equity shares, foreign equity, 
Now we have pathways to also invest in international markets. Like you will find mutual funds with fund of funds. So those FOF schemes invest your money in NASDAQ. They invest your money in international markets. Okay. So this is how we need to understand risk as well. Before we invest in the market, you do your own risk profiling where you try to understand whether you are a, 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 a risk high risk taker, whether you are a moderate risk taker, or whether you are completely a risk averse person, you're not willing to take any kind of risk. Yeah, sure, I will. Okay, so this is the concept about the investment. And I think to stop or uh, to kind of end my session, I would like to share lastly the principles of the investment theory. Just a minute. Okay, so before we end our session for today, we can just have a look at uh, the investment theory. Okay, so different investment theories that we have, okay, the accelerator theory of investment, we have the internal fund theory, the neoclassical, different uh, theories which have been designed over a period of time, but they are all focusing on the aspect about the decision making, the financial decision making, so that we are able to achieve our financial goals, okay. The most important one is a modern portfolio theory coined by uh, Professor Harry Markowitz, who coined the idea of portfolio. And there could be always a cost averaging of your currency. Okay, so whenever you're investing in the market, there could be sometimes when you're investing at a higher at peak, sometimes when you're investing at a lower. So at the end of the year, you average out the cost. That's extremely important. Also, reinvest the dividend that you receive. Uh, sometimes you may want to take the dividend because all of you wanted to have some supplementary income so that you could get financial freedom. But probably you could even look at reinvesting the dividend back into the equities, back into the markets, so that over a period of time that would grow and compound as well. Okay, So this is some key takeaways from the investment theory and principles that we have. I think we have uh, 10 minutes. We will open the forum for a Q&A. Because then I want sufficient time to answer your questions on the uh, basics of investment and portfolio. That's the topic that we've kind of looked at today. Yes, any questions? You can put them in chat box. I think you can now unmute and answer as well. Just You can raise your hand. I think I will give you uh, the option to I'll unmute you. Yes. What are the questions? Uh, please raise your hand. Are you able to... Uh, Yes. Yes, Handy. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. So I just wanted you to talk, uh, talk a little bit more on uh, the appraisals that you would use for different um, investment uh, vehicles. That's uh, your return on investments and the yields involved uh, with respect to uh, building a portfolio and uh, also in relation to risk. Uh, Handy, I would just request. In terms of the rate of return. Yeah, can you just repeat uh, what you said? Uh, did you mention something about appraisals? I could not get that uh, word. No, uh, could you please just say, uh, talk about the appraisal methods that you would use for uh, different uh, investment uh, portfolios or different investment vehicles available? And I also got, got in it. relation to, to, to risk. Yes, please. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So, uh, yes, the different methods of uh, evaluating. Yes, I got the question now. So, um, thank you for the question, Handy. So, standard deviation is one uh, measure that we use to assess the amount of risk. Now, this is ready calculated and this is available. When we go on uh, portals like, you know, whether we see CNBC or Bloomberg, Yahoo Finance, we would get the uh, the standard deviation, which measures the risk, which we can control to a certain extent. That is your uh, unsystematic risk, as you saw it on the slide also. And then there is beta, which measures the market risk. Okay, so standard deviation and beta both will help us to know the risk and we will have the return figures with us. So this will help us to understand uh, about the investments risk return relationship. Yes, now I will go to Abhi Krishnan. Handy, I'll come back to you. I hope this answered your query. 
Yes, Abhi Krishnan. Yeah, ma'am, you are just, uh, hi, good evening. I was just speaking about SIPs. So this SIP is, uh, how, what is your opinion with SIPs in the long run or short run? How can we trust this uh, SIP? Because we are getting a lot of feedback on SIP. So what is your uh, suggestions in going for this SIP's investment, whether with the market or with uh, the government bonds? So do you uh, give some suggestions on SIP investment? Uh, so, uh, Krishnan, here what happens is when we talk about SIPs, the Systematic Investment Plan, these are monthly or quarterly investments that you can make into mutual funds, which are mostly uh, into the equity markets. Also, there are schemes where there could be investments in bonds. The most important aspect is when you're selecting any mutual fund or any AMC, ensure that it is um, regulated. It's a regulated mutual fund. It's under the regulatory purview. Okay, that's what we see across the globe. Like say in every country, there is a regulator. So it should be a regulated product and it should be under the regulator, registered with the regulator of that country. And once that is there, then there is uh, no issue. See the history. Okay. Also, as I said, some of the mutual funds like HSBC have not had a very good and ethical past. So look at the history, check for any money laundering, like even if you Google, you will kind of get it. So check for money laundering or any such cases which have, you know, which the uh, mutual fund has been caught for in the past and avoid such mutual funds. But otherwise, it's a great way. If you want to invest and grow your money, you can look at equities. And as I said, these are emerging markets, India, Africa uh, and uh, Brazil and Russia and China. These are emerging markets, so definitely the money is bound to go. Okay. Now I will come to um De Decubra. Yeah, Samson. So everyone gets a chance to ask a question. Yes, you can unmute now. Yeah, my question here is about the uh investment. When we are talking about investment and the assets, when if I buy the house or I buy the float land so that one is this um, um uh, investment or is uh, assets and um, what are uh, different with uh differentiate with uh, investment and the uh, assets very so very i question. give you understand i'll explain it thank you so much for asking this question so yes. let's say if i buy a land okay yeah. and i probably give that on a lease maybe to a company Okay, yeah. I have long yeah. lease, maybe for 20, 25 years. And the company is saying every year we're going to pay a rent. Okay, so it becomes an asset because it is generating an income for me. So rather than putting that money in the equity market, what I did is I had money, I bought land or I bought a house, but I'm not staying in that house. Probably I give that house for Airbnb. Do we have Airbnb presence? Yeah. Yes, yes, we do. Okay. We so do. You, yeah. Yes, if I give my house or my property, I list it on Airbnb and I kind of get rentals, uh, you know, every month or every week. So what I'm doing is I'm generating income. So the definition of asset is okay. any item which helps you to generate income. Okay, investment will grow yeah. and compound your money. So basically your land or your house is also an investment because it is like maybe you might have bought that land for one lakh rupees. And now the value of that is 2 lakhs. So it's also mm. growing your money alongside. So it's giving you income plus it's also growing your money. So it's a combination of investment and asset. Okay, I understood now. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah, I hope uh, Andy, uh, Krishnan and yeah, Samsung, you understood. I hope your queries were answered. Anyone else yeah. would like to ask any questions? Okay, so John has asked a question that investors, uh, he would want to look out for investors where he can manage their money as he's managing Forex accounts. So John, in this case, I think you could probably reach out to investors via blogs or platforms, okay, where I don't know how Facebook works in Africa, but probably you can look at that. So look at blogs, platforms where you can connect to high net worth individuals, okay, who have a good amount, like five crores and above worth of surplus money with them. So probably you can connect with such people and manage their money and invest their money in the market. 
Yes. Anyone else for any questions? Yes, I think there's one more. Okay. So Ganiyu, that's how you pronounce your name? Yes. Good afternoon. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, I just want to ask a question relating to an asset uh, like land that uh, over time tends to appreciate in value, but it doesn't bring uh, regular cash flow. So uh, how, how do we classify those kind of land? Just a land that is bought, uh, that is appreciating value, but no regular cash flow. Are they also under, I know they are investment, but they are not cash, cash generating investment. So in terms of uh, asset um, allocation, or portfolio management, what percentage does those kind of assets supposed to have in, 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 in our investment portfolio? Thank you. Okay, so then you again, interesting question, I would say. Um, this could link, uh, link a little bit to the trends that we have, okay? Like what kind of trends now? So see, for example, as I said, that now in the next five to seven years in the emerging markets, you would see a lot of growth in the equities. This kind of a growth, I would not see into the real estate. Okay. If I'm an investor who's looking for a good amount of growth and multiplying our money, then in that scenario, I would choose equity. Okay. And I would not choose real estate because I know the growth is going to be very slow and sluggish. Okay. But somebody who feels that no real estate is very important, land is very important as an asset, could choose and probably then give it on lease or maybe generate some uh, income out of it. Okay. So again, it's extremely important to choose as per your preferences, but see which sectors, which segments uh, are going to grow in terms of asset allocation. Like if the interest rates start going down, so now you will not get a good return from bonds and fixed income also. So then the option that you're left, left with is equity. So it would largely depend on how the market scenario is at that point in time. And accordingly, you would uh, keep on choosing your asset allocation and changing it depending on market. It will not remain constant throughout. All right. Any more questions, anybody? Also, there is a link which has been given in the chat box. So I uh, would request everybody to fill up the uh, form. And all those, I'm sure everyone wants to get the recording for this session. So would request if you guys could just fill that up. All right. Thank you so much. I hope you uh, like the session and it has given you some insights on how you can go about uh, allocating your investments and also investing your money. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Siddharth. It was really a very wonderful session. And uh, thank you, each one of you, for uh, uh, attending the session. Like Dr. Siddharth has said that, so if you wish to get a recording of this session or want to know about the program more, please do fill in the Google form so that we can reach you out of it. So thank you, everyone. And um, we wish you a great ahead. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Siddharth.